Has environmental history lost its way? Um, I don't know that we're actually making huge inroads into sort of the main currents of historiography like we ought to. A roundtable discussion about the state of the field. I'm Sean Karaj, and you're listening to episode 51 of Nature's Past, a podcast of the Network in Canadian History and Environment. Late last year in December, Lisa Brady, the editor of the journal Environmental History, posted a provocatively titled blog article, Has Environmental History Lost Its Way? In that article, she reviews a roundtable panel from the most recent annual meeting of the Organization of American Historians, in which Mark Hersey, a historian from uh, Mississippi State University, challenged the audience to consider whether or not environmental history has broadened too widely in its scope and drifted from its methodological roots. Two years earlier, Lisa Piper, a Canadian environmental historian from the University of Alberta, wrote a similarly provocative article in History Compass in which she argues that, quote, Canadian environmental historians, even as they foreground nature as a historical actor, nevertheless continue to focus their attention and orient their investigations around questions of how human, social, cultural, economic, and political power reshaped both nature and human experience in the past. These articles garnered some attention, and Brady's article most recently drew a lot of attention online as environmental historians shared the link via online social networks and discussed its arguments. Others have now written responses to Brady's article attempting to answer her question. The discussion is focused on the question of whether environmental history should emphasize materialism and the use of environment as an analytical lens, or proceed as a big tent that incorporates a wide range of scholarship, regardless of methodology. On this episode of the podcast, I invited Lisa Brady, Mark Hersey, and Lisa Piper to discuss these questions and further explore whether or not environmental history has lost its way. I'm Lisa Brady at Boise State University, and I am the editor-in-chief of the journal Environmental History. I am Mark Hersey at Mississippi State University, where I direct the Center for the History of Agriculture, Science, and the Environment of the South. I'm Lisa Piper at the University of Alberta. Well, welcome, everybody. We are gathered here to discuss a provocative question that uh, Lisa Brady uh, posed in a recent article on Process, the uh, blog for the Organization uh, of American Historians called uh, Has Environmental History Lost Its Way? And I thought maybe we would begin by uh, giving Lisa a chance to uh, explain to us a little bit about a panel that she recently organized at the last meeting of the OAH. Sure. Um, so OAH often offers these state of the field panels, which are intended to bring newcomers up to uh, speed on what's going on in many of the subdisciplines of history and um, give a chance for people to discuss the, the future, the past, the current status of the field. And the panel that I helped to organize with Lincoln Bramwell, who's the chief historian at the U.S. Forest Service, was one of those types of state of the field panels. And I organized it intending not to do what a lot of the panels do, which is to bring, you know, sort of the the people who have long been shaping the field. Um, I wanted to get some fresh new voices. And so I asked uh, some people whose work I see as taking us in new directions. And so that was Mark Hersey, who's on our panel today, and um, Gerard Fitzgerald, and uh, Gary Kroll, and Janet Orr. And the panel was really fantastic because it brought really diverse perspectives on what environmental history is and where it's going. And uh, what was, I guess, unusual about the panel is you... Um, included participants who weren't uh, necessarily uh, or didn't necessarily consider themselves explicitly environmental historians. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, they're all, as I mentioned in my blog post for Process, they're all doing, in my opinion at least, they're all doing environmental history. They're all examining the relationships that people have had with nature over time and place. Um, but 
I think one of the things that I really wanted to do was to show the diversity of backgrounds and the wide variety of people who have come to environmental history in recent years and who therefore bring a richness of experience that is outside the the more traditional ways that, say, Mark and I and perhaps uh, Lisa, I'm not sure uh, what your training is, but um, in environmental history specifically. Now, maybe this is an opportunity for Mark to explain um, what he said on the panel. As you described it, he threw down the gauntlet. <laughs> that um, might have been a little bit of an exaggeration on my part <laughs> for prose sake, but I'll let Mark speak now. Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Um, prose stylings notwithstanding. Um, I didn't think I really um, threw down the gauntlet, uh, but I did express some dissatisfaction with uh, the state of the field and some sort of worries about it. Um, I'm not entirely sure that environmental history is as healthy as it could be. Um, and part, and this is, this largely has to do with how you measure it because measuring by like membership and even like the, the quality of scholarship, there's a lot of really good scholarship um, if, at the annual meeting of the ASEH, for instance. Um, and, you know, Lord knows uh, it's environmental history. It should be green. I don't think the field should ossify, right? Um, but I, th I, I worry that it sort of lost its core, that we don't enforce any kind of boundaries um, as to what the field should be. Um, just for instance, so um, environmental history, it seems to me, is interested fundamentally in the relationship between people and nature, not sort of incidentally in the relationship between people and nature. So the, uh, the example I think I gave is that I wrote uh, my first book was on George Washington Carver, um, and he happened to be a man, right? Um, but that doesn't make me a historian of gender, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're writing about city parks or whatever else, and we're happy to consider you an environmental historian, regardless of sort of the questions you're asking about that. And so that was, uh, that was my concern. Um, you know, um, it's become sort of mainstreamed. Um, it seems like a lot of people sort of woke up one day and with little reason, other than maybe another arrow in their quiver uh, for the job market, um, just as, just declared that they were environmental historians. And they've been sort of accepted accordingly. And I think this has resulted, at least to some degree, in a watering down um, of the discipline. Uh, and maybe it's, you know, maybe uh, because of this, and maybe I'm exaggerating here, but um, I don't know how seriously environmental history is taken by sort of public intellectuals or even scholars writ large. I, I worry it's become sort of an afterthought, which is to say that um, people experience racism in environmental ways, too. And it's like, well, OK, you know, um, in, instead of uh, challenging us to rethink our relationship with the natural world. Uh, so, Lisa, I want to give you a chance to respond to some of Mark's comments, uh, in part because you uh, published an article on History Compass um, called Knowing Nature Through History, uh, in which you um, you make an argument. It's not not identical argument, but there are some similarities about um, environmental history's aspirations to um, uh, develop a clear methodology uh, uh based around inserting nature as an actor in history uh, and the actual outcomes of what we see in terms of published books and articles in environmental history. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really interested to hear Mark and Lisa's uh, points on this because um, I like the way that Mark put it, for instance, that it needs to be not incidentally about people in nature, but fundamentally about people in nature. Um, I guess I do think that, uh, that there's a as I say in that piece, um, that there is a, a gap in some respects between what environmental history, what, what I had understood environmental history to be when I first encountered the field and all of the different material that um, ends up falling under that. I think that that, you know, in that piece in particular, I was talking about um, the Canadian historiography. And I think that there are some ways in which the Canadian historiography has evolved that has permitted that kind of breadth that might not apply in every different context. So for instance, the relationship between historical geography and environmental history in Canada has necessarily led to a, a rather broader approach um, and an important one, I think. I think that there are ways in which having that breadth um, has, has permitted a lot of different people to come to the table and say, you know, this is what I'm doing. It touches 
even incidentally on relations b between people and nature, um, but perhaps it does offer us some insight into um, these this this deeper relationship. Now, that said, I also do think that, and this was sort of my motivation in writing it, that it is time to, you know, or maybe it's always time <laughs> to, to revisit the question then, well, what is, you know, what is it that we do that is different and not just sort of, because um, environment can be very easily a really big field, um, you know, without without us, without doing some kind of policing, I think that that's almost, it's going to get very diffuse just because of the way in which environment is framed and the way that the field has developed. Lisa, I wonder if you want to jump in and, and uh, give us a little bit of your response to, to Mark's comments from the, the session at OAH. Well, you know, I, I, I agree with Mark certainly about needing to find a core for the field. And um, I like to think of myself as being very much engaged in my own research um, with looking at how humans and the non-human world have shaped each other in very material, physical ways. So I certainly don't disagree with him in terms of finding the need for a core. Um, but I think that, that Lisa makes an excellent point that environmental history has developed in different places with different origins. Um, and, and maybe I'm not quite mis uh, stating that correctly. I'm not sure that environmental history evolved out of historical geography in Canada or out of landscape history, say, for example, in the UK. But I do think that, that they do have some diverse backgrounds that um, that differentiate them to a certain degree from the type of environmental history that we could say arose here in the United States. Um, so I think if we take all of those things together, we have to broaden out our view of what environmental history is. Um, I absolutely agree with Mark that it needs to be fundamental rather than incidental. I think that's a wonderful characterization of, of what we need to do. Um, so, you know, as, as hesitant as I am uh, to see everything as environment, I, there are times when I think, well, I'm not sure that that's quite environmental history because, um, you know, where is the natural actor or the natural agency? Um, but I, I appreciate the ways that people who are working, for example, on um, you know, urban issues or on the body are pushing us to think about what the environment is and means. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that I really appreciate the, the sort of the big tent rather than the narrow lens approach um, mm -hmm. is that it, it can cause those of us who want to take the, the lens approach to be much more rigorous in how we define what environment is and, and what our field can contribute. Now, Mark, you made uh, some specific reference to uh, studying with Donald Worster. Uh, and and some of the ways in which Worcester defined environmental history, uh, particularly around this idea of uh, materialism and environmental history embracing a kind of materialist lens on the past uh, to think about uh, both human and non-human actors as having effects on the material world and, and that having consequences for events in the past. Um, has environmental history drifted from that materialist approach? Does it is that materialist approach necessary? Uh, for uh, the study of environmental history? Um, well, those are actually two different questions, right? Mm. Um, it's hard to say that it uh, that it's drifted. I, I would say that the first generation of historians tended to, of environmental historians, tended to be more materialist than not. So when you think of sort of the landmark books, uh, Changes in the Land, Dust Bowl, uh, The Columbian Exchange, these were very material books. But even then, there was Rod Nash's Wilderness um, and the American Mind, right, which is not especially material in, uh, in lots of ways. Um, but there's no question that uh, Don Worcester, um, and I should be clear that um, this is me and not not him here, mm -hmm. so I, he doesn't get slammed with anything. <laughs> he, thinks, he thinks more clearly and articulates more clearly most of the time, I suspect, than I do. Um, but uh, if you go to his, uh, you know, uh, Journal of American History roundtable piece. He was calling for a very material um, type of environmental history. And I think he's continued uh, this push. 
uh, for a very uh, environmental, a very uh, material type of, envi of environmental history. One that takes um, Darwin seriously, right? One that says, um, if Darwin is right, then um, uh, abstracting the human experience, abstracting history from the natural world, actually fundamentally distorts that experience, right? That, that history. Um, and so history is more um, truthful, right? It's more accurate when it's um, linked to the other than human world. So um, I think it has drifted from that vision. I mean, I think maybe put too baldly, there was a debate in the 90s, basically, and uh, Worcester came out on the wrong side of that debate, uh, maybe or on the right side of that debate, but not the popular side of that debate. And this is the uh, linguistic turn or? Uh... Yeah, that's sort of the, the cultural turn here, um, which is, uh, which I think dampened the field's enthusiasm for um, sort of material, for science, um, and then sort of uh, science as evidence. Um, in the roundtable, I argued uh, that one of the questions we were asked was, what's the most important innovation in our field over the past decade or so? And I thought it was the increasing integration of the history of science uh, into the field, which um, has been important in huge ways, and some are sort of positive and some are less positive from at least my vantage point. So historians of science have brought a much more sophisticated take on environmental science. Um, we you know, they brought an understanding of the ways in which science emerged from particular cultural contexts to address specific questions that were driven by specific cultural considerations, right? Um, and this has uh, forced environmental historians to sort of wrestle more self-consciously with what had been, at least previously, uh, a decidedly ambiguous view of science. Um, so science was, on the one hand, sort of an analytical object, at least for historians of science, but for historians, but for environmental historians, science was largely less an analytical object and more sort of a source of evidence and argument. So uh, environmental historians tended to be less inclined to get into the stuff of science. So even in books that were ostensibly about science. So I'm thinking of, um, if we go back to Worcester here, uh, his Nature's Economy, um, Robert McIntosh, um, who wrote a different history of ecology, uh, uh, dismissed uh, Nature's Economy as retrospective ecology. And his review. So this sort of increased sophistication that science has brought, um, the nuance that it, uh, that it brings, the, hist the historians of science have brought to the field is really welcome. Um, um, and you see it everywhere at a place like, uh, at a meeting like the ASEH. But because the downside of, uh, because science was sort of um, undermined, the authority of science was undermined, it wound up being downplayed. And this, I think, cobbled on to sort of the cultural turn generally. Uh, and so I think between these two things, the material has been sort of de-emphasized and uh, the cultural sort of understandings and the constructions, both of our knowledge about uh, environmental stuff and of um, the environment itself, um, has complicated uh, the effort to bring environment, um, to make the environment or to make a more material arguments about the environment um, as historians. Lisa, I might ask you the same thing then. Where where do you see uh, the place of materialism in environmental history? Oh, I'm really interested to hear what Mark was just saying because I actually also see science as integral to the place of materialism. Um, you know, I think that that environmental historians generally consider that nature is a thing and not just a concept. Um, and I think that a lot of the appeal of environmental history, a lot of the appeal of the field to people, particularly those coming from science backgrounds, um, and so there I'm thinking, for instance, of Edmund Russell, for instance, who's done such valuable work in evolutionary history. You know, he's one of many people in environmental history who are um, trained as scientists. Mm -hmm. Nancy um, but Langston, I think that another example. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, Verena Vinnivarder, you know. <laughs> so I think that you, part of the appeal is that um, within the ways that the environmental history acknowledged and engaged with physical things and offered to contribute to our understanding of how these things had changed or had changed us in the past. So, you know, they, it was a, a really interesting space for that. Um, and I, I think what Mark's saying there, that some of that got de-emphasized 
um, through the different ways that he's he's articulated is is quite right. But at the same time, environmental history was always something much broader. You know, mm-hmm. um, I remember doing coursework with Richard Hoffman, and he showed this Venn diagram of um, ecology, economy, and culture <laughs> overlapping. And you know, in in that diagram, the materialism is just one part of something that's much larger. And so everybody who was coming to it, for as much as they, the, the materialism was there and was part of the appeal and part of what drew them to it in some instances in the first, in, in the first place, um, that, there was, that they also sought the other aspects of it. And so perhaps part of the question isn't you know, part of the question isn't that we've moved too far away from materialism, but perhaps just that we haven't been giving it as much attention as we might feel that it warrants. Um, but I don't know where I stand in answering that. So It's uh, interesting to think about for the field, because I think in some ways um, it's the materialism, that material part of Worcester's model for environmental history or, or any of the subsequent um, ways of thinking about environmental history that set the field apart um, from other ways of, of approaching the past that, that establishes a kind of uh, lens or methodology of analysis. Um, and I wanted to ask the panel if they thought of or could think of any recent works in environmental history uh, that you could point to as an example of taking a kind of a materialist approach to, to studying the past. And I'll, I'll, I'll throw my book in there on the list, not my own book, but um, uh, Mark <laughs> Fiji's book, uh, Republic of Nature, I think attempts to do precisely this, to take just about any topic, in fact, topics in U.S. history that um, scholars might not at first blush consider to be environmental history um, and perform a kind of environmental history analysis using a, a materialist lens. I would jump in with um, much of the work, ongoing work in climate history and marine history. Um, so work by folks like Sam White and Dagmar de Groot um, in marine history bolsters mortal sea. I think that those remain profoundly materialist in some ways. Um, and I think that that speaks to how, in the case of climate history and its connections to cl- historical climatology, um, and in marine history and its connections to um, historical ecology. Uh, and there's also the work that's being done um, by Jeff Kunfer at the University of Saskatchewan that, you know, the HGIS kind of work. Um, all of that, I think, is really for, you know, it very much foregrounds materialism in certain ways. I, I would suggest that uh, Brett Walker's piece on asbestos and 9-11 that was part of the recent um, disease in the Anthropocene Forum uh, in the October issue October 2015 issue of Environmental History is an excellent example of it, where he looks at the the um, sort of the chemistry of asbestos, the uh, geography of asbestos, and then the uh, transformation of it into building materials, and the he, he then connects those material things to the politics and the economics of building in New York City and then takes us back to the material again when the the trade center is destroyed and the asbestos is essentially released and then what does that do to to human bodies and I think that his piece is is a really good sort of full circle material look at a particular um, uh, part of the environment which occurs naturally asbestos. And Mark, are there any uh, recent works that stand out in your mind as examples of a more materialist approach to environmental history? Uh, sure. You guys have mentioned uh, a, a bunch of really good ones uh, already. Um, I had thought about uh, Ed Russell's uh, evolutionary history, of course. Um, I think, uh, too, that uh, highlight the degree to which it's not an either-or sort of cultural or material thing would be um, Thomas Andrews' Killing for Coal. The material world really matters a great deal, I think. You know, uh, he spends a lot of time talking about the geology. Um, and then beyond that, it's also a really, obviously, great social and uh, labor history. Um, Paul Sutter's new book, Let Us Now Praise Famous Scullies, um, is prof- uh, profoundly material, right? Uh, and the argument, um, and it's a nuanced argument, so I'll be doing it an injustice, even attempting to sort of uh, distill it here, uh, but is that... Um, that this that Georgia's you know little Grand Canyon, which is an erosion gully, 
right, a huge erosion gully, which is now a state park, um, isn't actually all that ironic a story. In many ways, it's as natural as the Grand Canyon it's named after, right, which is that um, the way the subsoil and the soil lays out when it combines with the erosion, it erodes precisely this way, right, that there's nothing that, you know, that there were uh, the same methods that were practiced elsewhere in, uh, in, in the Piedmont didn't result in this kind of erosion. This was a local thing that had to do with um, material realities, right? So, yeah, there are, there are plenty of really good uh, material studies still. Now, uh, Lisa, part of your uh, post on pro uh, process uh, suggested that environmental history has had a big tent approach to the development of the field, that it's been very broad um, in terms of what topics it encompasses. And I think anyone who's been to the annual meeting of the American Society for Environmental History can see that just in the program in terms of the types of papers that are presented. Have there been, in your mind, advantages to a big tent approach to the development of the field? I think so. Um, and it comes back to my earlier comment about uh, sort of challenging everyone who wants to do environmental history to really think about their their definitions. And I don't mean that in a, a pedantic sort of way, but I think that one of the issues that environmental historians face is what is our field exactly? What do we mean by nature? I mean, these are the big questions that we've been struggling with as a field for you know, generations of scholars now. Um, but I think what is really appealing to me about the big tent is that um, even if what someone is presenting, say, at the ASEH or the ESEH, ESEH or any of the, the wonderful conferences on environmental history, um, even if it's not my definition of environmental history, I can take some really great things out of it and apply it to my own work. And I think one of the great benefits of, of our field is how inclusive it has been. Um, you know, you go to some of our conferences and there are people who are joining the field who are maybe just dipping their toe in for an article or, or a presentation or something, but we really welcome the ideas. We might challenge them, but we really welcome the ideas because it's going to encourage us to really think about our own work in new ways. And I think that's what I like about more of the big tent. Now, I, I think that we do have to have a rigorous analytical lens. Otherwise, everything can become environmental history, right? If you mention the word nature or wilderness in your article, then, oh, I can claim environmental history. That's mm -hmm. not true at all. Um, but I, I do think that the big lens or the big tent can help us broaden our understanding of the, the really diverse relationships human cultures across time and place have developed with their, their specific environments. Uh, Lisa, do you agree with uh, some of those advantages or are there some risks uh, that you see to a big tent approach to the development of the field? I think, no, I, I agree. <laughs> I think those are all um, very definite advantages. Um, you know, I think that it's, it's somewhat inescapable uh, that environmental history would have a breadth problem. I remember when I was doing work with Niche on trying to um, identify sources of quantitative environmental data. Mm. And so then the question was, well, what's environmental data? And it, it was just about everything, you know? So <laughs> we then narrowed to climate, but even narrowing to climate, climate touches so many different things. So just, and that comes back to what Lisa was just saying right there with, you know, really how we have to wrestle with those definitions and, and try to make them meaningful. Um, but at the same time, you know, try to include every, you know, the things that are relevant. Um, and we also face challenges because we are historians and so we're humanists. And so we can't ignore all those aspects of our relations with nature that are not material. The advantage that I've found um, in the big tent approach has, has also been in that it promotes it can promote interdisciplinarity and it can really promote collaboration. Mm. So in a lot of the work that I do um, here in Alberta, I end up working with people who aren't historians um, because, you know, we, um, they, there's a, a certain, and I don't think that they, uh, that they 
they don't conceive of themselves as environmental historians, but because the the of the breadth of the field and the ways that it's open and it, it doesn't sort of say, oh, okay, you've got to stop right there because you're not doing environmental history any, anymore, I can continue to work with them to try to sort of think about new ways of understanding relations between people and the rest of nature in the past. So I think that that, that is something that can be, that is an advantage mm -hmm. for sure. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought about that, that... Uh... You know, we may have non-environmental historians at environmental history conferences, but we may also have non-historians um, being brought into the fold. Um, so uh, these questions got me thinking about teaching environmental history, particularly at the graduate level, because if we're thinking about defining a field or uh, disciplining its boundaries, um, I think it, you know, it happens at the graduate level. Um, so for, for each of you, and maybe Mark, um, or uh, uh, Mark, if you want to start off, uh, when you teach environmental history at the undergraduate or graduate level, um, how much do you emphasize environment as an analytical lens? Uh, I emphasize it as an, anal as an analytical lens um, a great deal. Um, you know, um, I started thinking about the, the tent lens thing as sort of a backwards way into this question, uh, in part because I showed up at Mississippi State um, and at roughly the same time that the Agricultural History Society's headquarters moved here. And um, some colleagues of mine, uh, Jim Geese and um, Alan Marcus, basically uh, pointed out that virtually everything I wrote about was rural or agricultural. Uh, but I never, ever thought of myself as an agricultural historian. Um, and uh, because I've been associated with agricultural, the Agricultural History Society, um, I've seen that one of the big problems that they've had is trying to convince people that they're doing agricultural history. So people writing about meatpacking facilities in Nebraska or whatever, um, they think of themselves as labor historians, not agricultural historians. And so it was Jim Geeson who uh, mentioned this sort of tent idea to me. Um, and so um, I say all of this, that, which is say agricultural history is a tent, right? There is no analytical lens there, right? There is no set of tools. But I come out of environmental history at a time where you were still equipped with certain tools, right? Where you were still, I was, you know, trained with, and I read books in historical ecology and archaeology and ecology and all of those sorts of things. Hmm. Um, uh, and so I try and uh, make my students think about this too. Like, what's the environmental historian's toolkit, right? What do they need to think about? How do they begin to think about these things? What sets environmental history apart from agricultural history? So if agricultural history has always been a tent, um, environmental history has not. It's become one of, uh, of late. Um, and so I try and um, uh, teach, my, I teach my students to sort of focus on the material things. And I come back to Darwin all the time that we're the, you know, the, the discipline that, that, takes, that takes Darwin seriously. Um, and I worry, um, I, I tell them, and I'm very open about sort of my bias here, that I'm from the environmental wing of the environmental history field, right? That, um, you know, uh, I'm in some ways an outlier in my own field. I know Lisa says that it has to be more than just, um, you know, incidentally there. But this hasn't been my hasn't been my experience when I go to, you know, the ASEH or the ESEH or the World Congress for Environmental History in Portugal a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see um, that all of these things are anything more than incidentally environmental. Um, and so uh, I tell them that I'm sort of teaching them uh, maybe an old fashioned way. But I really do emphasize the material aspects of it. Uh, that, uh, and maybe I'm less afraid of uh, of determinism in that sense. I think, um, you know, I think environment the environment does set boundaries that people have to deal with. Now, I'm, I'm not embracing environmental determinism as sort of an analytical tool because it's sort of the opposite of that, right? But I think that you do have to acknowledge that there are material realities and that we run up against them. That um, as much as, say, racism creates a, a climate where the, where the risk is dis, uh, disproportionately shared, right? Mm -hmm. Where you think about Katrina or these natural disasters, uh, race plays a role in who's going uh, to bear the, the, the brunt of this, uh, this ostensibly natural disaster. But people drown in water. They don't drown in racism, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, they need to understand the, uh, the material thing. Um, so I'm actually teaching uh, environmental history this semester, uh, the environmental history of, of North America. So I'm having them uh, sort of early on read the, the sort of, you know, the, pre the prehistory of environmental history, then the emergence of the self-conscious field, 
then sort of the essays, the Journal of American History, and there are a whole bunch of essays. Um, in fact, I, I might point out here that environmental history is sort of prone, and I feel self-conscious about this, but sort of prone to navel-gazing, right, <laughs> um, from 1990. Uh, then we have, you know, every few years, someone's thinking, what does it mean? So March Stewart, and was it 97 or 98? And then five years, six years later, um, we get, um, you know, uh, in, in another set of essays in, in history theory and um, anyway, uh, so, but I want them to think about how the field has, uh, has developed and, and why it's developed the way it is. So I don't, it's not that I, I try and shelter them from the, the sort of the, the, the cultural turn, but I do when I teach, you know, books that are, uh, more cultural and less environmental, I ask them to, to think about the way that, about why this is and the way in which taking a material view of this might actually shift the argument or undercut the argument, uh, in some meaningful way. I should interject to say that uh, a while back I used to keep a bibliography called What is Environmental History? And it just grew so large, I stopped uh, updating it. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, Lisa, how about you? When you're teaching at the undergraduate or graduate level, what uh, approach do you take to teaching environmental history? How much emphasis do you place on environment as an analytical lens? Um, I place a, a fair emphasis on it, I'd say. Um, I... I in some respects, and this is in part because some of the environmental, sometimes I teach environmental history as courses in environmental history. Other times I'm teaching courses that are um, like the history of the Canadian West mm. in the 20th century. And, um, but I, there's environmental history in it. And certainly when I'm teaching environmental history to graduate students, there's a heavy emphasis on, on materialism and on their need to um, be able to engage, even if they're not necessarily interested in pursuing uh, that as the, the main thrust of their work, that they have to be able to engage and critique it. With undergraduate students, um, I'm a bit more open because I've I found that some students get very put off environmental history um, when they think that it's when it's about science when they think that it's about knowing something about something um, using tools that aren't the conventional tools of the historian hmm. um, and on the flip side of that there's also some undergraduate students who when they realize that that's a part of environmental history get really excited about the discipline because hmm. you know the, to them it's like a treasure they didn't know that they'd ever be able to get to study that kind of thing in a history class so i try to with some of my undergraduate teaching um I guess because, I don't know, I want to recruit students to the field, <laughs> whether that's a good idea or not, but I do. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 I try to, um, I, I, I sort of, I, I try not, I try to present it in a way whereby they feel that they can engage with it um, more if they want to, um, you know, if it really, really appeals to them. And so I tend to emphasize uh, one of the things that I do is I work with, you know, I'll give them um, sort of works of science to read and to try to engage with and to try to think about so that they can use those, you know, that they can develop the skill set to engage with other disciplines. And so this goes to what Mark was saying about having to read historical ecology and archaeology. Those are things that I get my students to do, um, you know, as part of as part of the skills that, that I'm trying to equip them with, um, whether it's in introducing environmental history to them or in more advanced settings. So. These are this, some of the similar arguments that um, uh, came up in an interview that we republished from uh, historicalclimatology.com on the Niche website uh, with uh, Dagmar de Groot and Richard Hoffman and Alan McKecker and, and John McNeil talking about teaching climate history and confronting some of the same difficulties of uh, getting students to engage with the scientific literature. And I think John was, was co-teaching the course with a climatologist. Um, Lisa, how about you, uh, your approach to teaching environmental history, analytical lens or big tent? <laughs> well, you know, it's, um, it's a little of both, uh, at the graduate level, I certainly emphasize uh, the same sorts of tools that Lisa and, and Mark have been talking about getting them engaged in reading scientific work so that they can understand, um, how to apply that data and that understanding to their own work, um, at the, the undergraduate level, 
you know, I incorporate environmental history into every class I teach. I, I mainly teach courses that are specifically identified as environmental history, but I also teach a course on themes in world history. And my theme is revolution. And so I spend a lot of time on the agricultural revolution, on the Columbian exchange, um, getting students who may or may not go on into history to think about the roles that, um, that the natural world and scientific uh, discovery and analysis play in our understanding of the development of human societies. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I am also, like Mark, teaching a North American environmental history course this term. And the first week, I actually spent all on dinosaurs and, um, you know, getting them to think about how the, the continent itself, as we currently define it, has changed over time both in terms of um, what kinds of animals and plants have populated it, but then what that also means for uh, thinkers and and um, policymakers and other people down the road, for example, like um, Thomas Jefferson and his, the debates over extinction and the fossils and that sort of thing. So I am very much a materialist in, in my presentation to my classes, especially at the undergraduate level. Um, I also am very much about getting students to think about history in terms of evolution. And coming from a state like Idaho, um, that has been a problem in the past where Mm. I've had students say, well, I don't think evolution is real. And, you know, I have to tell them, well, your, your views are your views. But for this class, you have to understand how this process of evolution impinges on human development. Um, So Mm. it's a little bit, you know, in that case, I suppose I have to be big tent Mm -hmm. to incorporate my students' beliefs and backgrounds and prior knowledge. Um, And, and I think it's worked, uh, but it's, it can be a little bit difficult, you know, to take a a purely materialist approach when you've got a really diverse set of students that um, may or not uh, sort of push back on those kinds of ideas and, and approaches. Yeah, I think I've had similar concerns when I emphasize materialism in my teaching of environmental history, especially at the graduate level. Um, I've always wondered, you know, what what will happen one day when I have a classroom where I have a student who is very strictly constructivist um, and uh, and and doesn't accept uh, the uh, material forces on uh, on uh, events in the past. Uh, thus far, it has not happened. <laughs> they've, they've, <laughs> they've all bought into it pretty quickly, <laughs> which is lucky for me, I suppose. Um, yeah. Now, I had a different question here as the conclusion about the potential of a fracturing of the field along the lines of environment as lands or environment as tent. But I, just in thinking here, I wonder if it's better to conclude our discussion by trying to give some kind of response to the title of your post, Lisa. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask Lisa Piper to begin. Has environmental history lost its way? I don't think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, uh, I think that there are, that I think that those people who find their home in environmental history um, still have a very strong sense of what environmental history is. And I think that there is still room to be, you know, to be open because I think, frankly, that one of the reasons that the field has, I think, developed actually really rapidly in recent, you know, in the past 20 years has been in part because it was sort of um, absorbing these insights from all of, from a lot of different places. And I think that, you know, that, that, uh, that has been a very productive kind of engagement. That said, you know, perhaps maybe one of the ways, I I think that it's valuable as a result to navel gaze, but maybe it's more valuable to be even more programmatic in our navel gazing for us to sort of um, articulate clearly some of the things. And we all do this informally at conferences and and so forth, but I do think that there is always this place to to speak clearly about what it is we're doing and remind ourselves that there are other people who are also environmental historians and they're doing the same thing. Um, even if, you know, we, we are still, um, even if we are sometimes still outliers within our own departments, as I sometimes, you know, not anymore. I've now got 
Shannon Sendenbauer, who's a colleague here. <laughs> um, but for a while, I felt like an outlier in my department because I was the only environmental historian, and so nobody else was engaging with with um, material sort of material aspects of the past in quite the same way that that I was. Um, so I don't think that it's lost its way, but I think it's always good to stop and reflect on you know where we've been going and and you know what where we are right now. And Mark, I maybe come back to you. Has it lost its way? Um, see, I'm kind of a glasses half empty kind of guy sometimes. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I don't know. Lost its way uh, indicates it had like a, a really clear direction at some point, right? Um, I think it's well. I think the the interventions of the of the um, 1990s, the debates in the 1990s, the cultural turn, the greater in uh, greater influx of history of science and all of that sort of stuff, um, did, did fundamentally disorient the field, right? And it, um, you know, what we get, have um, with apologies uh, to Robert Wiebe are sort of a bunch of island communities, right, that sort of gather under this umbrella, uh, maybe at the ASEH. Um, and this does have lots of benefits, right? Membership um, is high. Uh, I think when I first started going, was it in Durham, the first ASEH I went to? Um, and now we're in, you know, Seattle and Chicago and, um, and it's brought in a lot of really, really great scholarship. So, um, that is all, uh, that, that's all great. Um, my concern actually with it losing its way is, um, partly, and, uh, and Lisa, uh, hinted at this, um, which is to say there are lots of jobs for environmental historians, but usually once a department has one that they can check that box. You know, um, I don't know that we're actually making huge inroads into sort of the main currents of historiography like we ought to. Um, I don't see environmental history sort of radically um, rewriting, say, uh, the main currents of, of American history. I think it remains more or less marginal in a way that I don't think the first generation of scholars were marginal. Right. I think uh, the work of uh, Cronin in uh, Changes in the Land or Worcester in Dust Bowl or um, you sort of run down the list of people. I think they really um, got the field, they got the broader American, uh, they got the attention of the broader field of American history. And I worry that as we sort of uh, fracture and gather um, under one big tent, but we don't have sort of a core there, um, that we lose our ability to make that sort of splash. Now, there are obviously environmental histories that have done very well in uh, the main currents and have shaped things. Um, but uh, I recently wrote a, a review essay, maybe yeah, pretty recently, uh, on Walter Johnson's River of Dark Dreams. And uh, Walter Johnson's a, a, uh, really a phenomenal scholar. Um, he's at Harvard. Uh, his first book was brilliant. Uh, the, the River of Dark Dreams was actually profoundly material in its orientation and its argumentation, but it wasn't environmental. So it's about like the lower Mississippi River, but there's no or the, the lower Mississippi Valley, but there's no sense of what that valley is actually like. And most of his evidence is drawn from actually Alabama um, rather than the the lower Mississippi uh, River Valley. Um, I don't know if you know Chris Morris's um, Big Muddy, but you wouldn't have any idea that these were about the same place. Um, and the the point of this is that he took up issues that notable environmental historians like Ed Russell and Mark Fiji and Paul Sutter and Jim Geeson and, uh, and some others had written about. Um, without ever referencing them. And it's not, I, I just think he's not reading them. I, I just don't, I just don't think we're being read. And that's probably on us, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I worry that we're, you know, that we're so welcoming that we're not sort of pushing people to um, see what this material focus would, how this material focus would change these sort of main currents. Um, of uh, the broader understanding of what it has meant to be human over time. And I think the first generation of environmental historians did that, at least to a greater degree than we're doing now. And maybe that's unfair. I don't know. Well, it's a provocative question. And uh, Lisa, I'll uh, let you have the final word on that question. Um, uh, one that I think is an important opinion, given that you're the editor of the journal. <laughs> <laughs> right. Am I engaging in futile uh, work here? No, I definitely don't think it has lost its way. Um, I, part of 
you know, this this goes along with my uh, characterization of Mark throwing down the gauntlet, right? Mm-hmm. I, I took a bit of poetic license in that and perhaps um, proposed too provocative a question for my the title of the blog. Um, but you want to get people reading, right? And I've been really pleased that people have been reading the blog and responding to it. So, um, no, I don't think environmental history has lost its way. Um, you know, I say at the end of the uh, the blog that what environmental history can demonstrate is that whether you take the tent or the lens approach, all roads or all paths lead back to nature. And I think that, that Mark is certainly right that um, – we aren't reaching the broad audience and it may be, you know, going back to what Lisa was saying about the navel gazing, maybe we are too immersed in reading each other's work to get it out there to other people. I don't know. Um, But I, I actually think that environmental history is, is very vibrant field. It is um, a really uh, diverse field. And I think that is one of its main attractions to me is that I can read environmental histories of rivers. I can read environmental histories of um, of, uh, permafrost, right, or of roadkill or of track housing. Um, And and I think that uh, we do need to be better marketers of our own work. I'm not sure it's a problem in writing. I'm, I definitely know it's not a problem in argumentation or evidence. I think it may just be that environmental historians, for as rambunctious as we can be at, at meetings, uh, we're pretty shy about getting our work out there. And I think if we've lost anything, it's um, a sense of going out and really promoting the field. And I'd like to think that um, podcasts like this certainly will reach a very broad audience. You've got a wonderful audience out there, Sean. So, you know, maybe this will be the start of um, not finding our way, but bringing other people to the path. Well, I think I'll close things off uh, by saying that uh, we'll leave it to listeners to provide their answers to that last question of whether or not environmental history has lost its way. They can post uh, responses in the comments thread or um, post some responses on Twitter to the uh, At Nature's Past Twitter account. Uh, And I'll close off here with uh, the words of uh, Hal Rothman, former editor of the journal. Uh, His first post on the uh, uh, ASCH listserv in 1996, he wrote, environmental history is one of the most exciting new disciplines to emerge in the past two decades. It's now been two decades since he wrote that. uh, And I'll ask listeners to uh, respond as to whether or not they see environmental history still as an exciting discipline. Uh, I want to thank Lisa, Mark, and Lisa for joining me here and uh, discussing this very provocative, very interesting uh, blog post. Uh, thank Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Nature's Past is produced with support from the Network in Canadian History and Environment. This episode was made by Lisa Brady, Mark Hersey, Lisa Piper, and me, Sean Karash. Music for Nature's Past was licensed by Creative Commons. Details on the artists can be found on our show notes page at niche-canada.org slash naturespast where you can also download new episodes, subscribe to the podcast through iTunes and other podcast players, and leave comments. Please let us know what you think about the podcast by leaving comments and writing a short review on our iTunes page. You can also follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash nature's past. You can always find out more about environmental history research in Canada from the Niche website at niche-canada.org, and you can find out more about the topics we discussed on this episode on our show notes page. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back soon with another episode of Nature's Past.